With me today are Lisa English, the Federal Programs Coordinator, and Alexandra McCann, the Federal Programs Financial Specialist Principal. This webinar will be recorded, as you can see on the screen, and it will be posted along with the PowerPoint on the Pandemic Relief Fund website, which we will um, view at the end of this presentation. I want to start with some great news uh, for the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which is Title I-A, Title I-C, Title I-D, uh, Title IIA, and so forth, all of our title pro programs. Just yesterday, um, we received uh, um, an email from the U.S. Department of Ed with a template for two waivers, and these are areas where we have received numerous uh, calls and emails about. So that includes waiving the 15% excess carryover limitation for Title I-A moving from the 2020-2021 school year to 21-2022. Until yesterday, we did not know that uh, states would be able to do this. So this is good news for Title I LEAs. The other piece of good news is we were also provided a template to extend the performance period of all the ESEA programs for 2019-2020. Those, uh, the performance period for all ESA, ESEA programs for 2019-2020 would normally end this September 30th. But with this waiver, uh, those funds, the performance period for all ESEA funds will uh, go through September 30th, 2022. Again, great news for LEAs. Idaho uh, will be submitting the completed template uh, to the US Department of Ed very shortly. Uh, as soon as the superintendent signs it, it will, uh, we will send it off to the US Department of Ed. So good news there. I also wanted to talk very briefly about President Biden's uh, budget and that this is proposed. I wanna be very clear that this is what he is proposing in his budget for 2022-2023. Nationally, Title I is funded $16.5 billion. The president's 2022-2023 budget proposes the Title I program be increased to $36.5 billion. That's an increase of $20 billion. President Biden's budget proposal, which he released on May 28th, would keep funding for the existing Title I program at the current level of $16.5 billion, and he would create a new formula for distributing an additional 20 billion in equity grants to states that work to close gaps between rich and poor districts and between those uh, serving primarily white students and those that enroll more students of color. This is really good news for LEAs with high percentages of underserved populations. And of course, we'll have to wait and see if Congress supports this idea or, or what, how the, we'll have to wait and see how the budget ends up um, being finalized. Under the three ESSER grants awarded to Idaho, one half of 1% is allowable for administering the grants. This amount totals to $3,418,436. Of that 3.4 million, the legislature provided spending authority of 300,000 total for the next three years for the SDE to administer the ESSER grants. With these funds, we have promoted Lisa English to the federal programs coordinator position and her main responsibility will be to provide support to LEAs in all areas of ESSER. Hiring additional staff to administer ESSER activities is definitely an allowable activity for LEAs under the ESSER programs. Please, you can continue to contact me with uh, your questions um, as well as Alexandra, but just know that Lisa is uh, hitting the ground running um, and becoming an expert on all things ESSER. 
We have a very brief update on the ARP ESSER funding. States were notified June 25th that due to a downward revision in calculating Title I allocations by one state, USED has received the ARP, uh, has revised the ARP ESSER allocations. And that means an additional 200,000 uh, for Idaho. LEA allocations will be revised in the fall, probably October, to account for this increase as well as to account for any revisions as a result of adjustments made to the significantly expanding LEA charters. I want to review the requirements around the two plans that are required for LEAs. And after each, each of these sections, I'll pause and answer any questions that you have. So LEAs are responsible for developing and posting two ARP ESSER plans. Both of these plans are a condition of receiving funds, even though LEAs will have access to their ARP ESSER funds prior to the plans being due. On June 30th, an email was sent to, the, uh, to all LEA superintendents, business managers, and federal program directors. And included in the email was the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan checklist and the ARP ESSER use of funds plan template. The LEA's most currently approved back to school plan and this checklist must be posted on the LEA's website August, by August 2nd, so just next month. Let's look first at the safe return to in-person instruction plan requirements first. It's my understanding that last summer or early fall, every LEA in Idaho submitted a back to school plan to the state board office. A checklist has been developed with stakeholder input for this plan. So use this checklist against the LEA's back to school plan that was developed last year or the LEA's most currently approved back to school plan. It's possible that the LEA developed a back to school plan last year and since then has reviewed it and revised it. So use this checklist against the most currently approved back to school plan. The checklist that went out in the June 30th email did not include or most current language that you see on the screen here. We added this language based on questions we were getting from several of you. So as a result, the most recent checklist will have this language. The next section of the safe return plan includes mitigation strategies information. The first column in this table includes CDC recommended prevention mitigation strategies, which are required by the US Department of Ed to be addressed in the LEA's plan. It's okay if the LEA's most currently approved back to school plan does not include one or more of these strategies just make sure to address them in the next revision of the plan. Addressing a particular strategy might be to describe why the LEA is not implementing it. This section of the safe return to in-person instruction plan is a narrative description of your back to school plan about how the LEA is addressing important issues such as accelerated learning strategies for students' academic needs. How are students getting back on track? Students and staff's social, emotional, and mental health needs and other needs that the LEA has determined. A timeline for reviewing and revising the plan every six months through September 30th, 2023. That timeline must be also included in this plan. 
identifying areas of support or technical assistance the LEA needs from the state related to implementing the plan. Again, it's okay if the LEA's most currently approved back to school plan does not include one or more of these strategies. Just make sure to address them in the next revision of the plan. The next section of the plan includes five assurances. Assurance one and five must be yes. So that's the LEA assuring that to the best of the LEA's knowledge and belief, all information in the plan is true and correct. And the plan and the checklist are publicly available on the LEA website. If your response to two, three and or four is no, be sure the next revision includes meaningful stakeholder consultation which includes representation from specific populations present in your community. If any, of the if any of the responses are no, develop a process for including these requirements in the plan's next revision. Let's review some scenarios to help understand when your plan needs to be reviewed and revised. So for example, in scenario one, I'm gonna move my viewer so I can see. In scenario one, the LEA developed a back to school plan before ARP ESSER was enacted. And so that was before March 11th, 2021. But the plan is missing some required elements as determined by one or more no responses in table one or table two or the assurances section. The LEA must revise its plan to include all required elements no later than six months after it last reviewed its plan or by November 24th, whichever date is earlier. After that, review and revise the plan if necessary with meaningful input from stakeholders every six months for the duration of the ARP ESSER grant, grant which is September 30th, 2023, this date does not include the tidings amendment. The revised plan must be published on the LEA's website. So that is one scenario. Another scenario might be that the LEA does not have a back to school plan. Maybe this is a brand new um, LEA that's eligible for um, ESSER funds, but for whatever reason has not developed a back to school plan. By August 2nd, so next month, the LEA must develop a safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan and include all the requirements identified in the checklist in that plan. Email the URL where the plan is posted on the LEA's website by August 2nd to Lisa. Review and revise the plan if necessary with meaningful input from stakeholders every six months for the duration of the RFESR grant through September 30th, 2023. And the last uh, plan revision scenario could be that the LEA developed a back to school plan either before or after ARP ESSER was enacted. And that plan was developed with meaningful stakeholder feedback and it included public input and it includes all of the required information as determined by all yes responses in table one, table two, and the assurances section of the checklist. Post the back to school plan in this scenario and the safe return to in-person instruction and continuity of services plan checklist by August 2nd, next month. Review and revise the plan if necessary with meaningful input from stakeholders every six months for the duration of the ARP ESSER grant through September 30th, 2023, and post the revised plan on the LEA's website. And I certainly understand that there may be additional scenarios that uh, we can talk through if, if you have that. But let's take a look at one more slide and then I'll pause for questions. Email the completed and signed checklist to Lisa English by August 2nd. Please notice that both the superintendent or charter administrator and the board of trustees president's signatures are required. 
All right, let's pause there for just a minute and see if there are any questions. All right, um, Karen, we have a few questions in the chat. Um, the first one is from Todd. And um, he's asking um, if um, the folks can get the updated document. He has completed the other one. Um, and if they do address um, the document, uh, do we check them? Yes, on the checklist. Okay, so the updated safe return to in person document, I think, is what you are referring to. Um, we could do this a couple of ways. Yes, of course, we can send you that. It will be up on our website, hopefully by the end of the week. The other thing you, we could do is you could submit what you've already done. And if we're missing any information, we'll contact you and collect that information. Okay, Karen, uh -huh. can you hear me? I can, Todd, thank you. So my biggest question was I went through with, with Lisa and we, I went through my plan and there were a couple of areas that I had missed. So I had, I had checked no. I have a board meeting in July. What I'm wondering is if after that board meeting, let's say they approve that change, would I then go back and uh, just update that checklist and after my board meeting submit that and then post everything? Or do I submit it now with the recommended changes that I will present to the board. Todd, if I were you, I would wait until after the July board meeting and uh, submit it after that. Okay, and then that means I would be able to check yes on all of them because I'm gonna go back through and fix the pieces that were missing, is that correct? Okay, as long as you, you involve stakeholders and given the public um, a chance to provide input, absolutely. Okay. So the next question, there are actually two questions from Brady. And he's asking, if we check now on any of the questions, can we still draw down funds as long as it is addressed in the next provision? Just want to make sure we can access funds in the interim. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we will be, um, you know, there will be a process of allocating and avoiding the second installment of the funds, but also in the fall, um, due to the new and expanded charters, we will be reallocating, uh, sorry, recalculating the allocations. And in addition, um, also we have an extra $200,000 now that also will be distributed. Um, and the other question uh, that Brandy posed is, um, is is meaningful consultation defined? Does a survey count as meaningful consultation? I'm sorry, Alexander, does what? Is meaningful consultation defined? Does a survey count as meaningful consultation? Hmm. To me, meaningful consultation means a conversation. Um, so for example, when we were developing the Idaho State ARP ESSER plan, um, we had different people who were leads on different sections of the plan and each of us conducted several meetings, more than one meeting uh, on our sections. A survey would be one way to collect information I'm, I'm not quite sure, and the U.S. Department of Ed does not identify what meaningful means. Um, so I'm gonna leave that up to the LAA. And I think it's definitely one way to um, collect information. Uh, I think having a discussion, having a meeting around the information brings it up to another level of engaged stakeholder input. Okay, um, next question is from Michelle. Um, and also actually Todd um, posted a question um, of similar nature. Um, who is actually approving the documents? Is that just the local school board? And then Todd, that's his question as well. Um, the school board represents their constituents. 
question mark. No, my question was, so the school board represents their zone. If we review it in board meeting and patrons are able to be there for the review of the plan, to me, that would meet the the constituent uh, or the requirement to provide feedback from patrons. Um, yes, that I would agree that that's one way to get feedback. But who's writing the plan? Who's developing the plan? Were stakeholders involved in developing the plan, or or are you suggesting to develop the plan? and then ask for feedback. The plan was already developed and approved by the board from the board feedback. So the board made recommendations after administration produced the document and then the school board made recommendations and adjustments based on feedback from their constituents. Yes, yeah. okay. Yes, thank you for uh, making that distinction that the plan is already uh, written and developed. So you're talking about the revising process. So yes, I think that would be fine. And then we have one more question. Can you explain the last item in table two of the safe return to in-person? Uh, it's the statement regarding technical assistance. Oh, sure. The U.S. Department of Ed is interested in knowing if an LEA needs support or technical assistance in any areas of the plan. Um, for the most part, I think LEAs are great about reaching out either through an email or a phone call and asking questions. But if you have some sort of uh, uh, area identified in the plan where you could use some support or technical assistance, then just mark yes. And we will reach out to you and see how we can help. And if not, just mark no. All right, th this is Kelly Trudeau. That was my question. Can you hear me? I can, um, Kelly. So I guess my, my confusion was we don't have to have a statement about that in our plan because so I, I just want to make sure if I mark no on that, that's not something we have to actually write in our plan that we're going to seek assistance from the State Department. Okay, all right, yeah, I think that is very reasonable. And uh, perhaps if you mark yes, your plan would include areas where you did need uh, support or technical assistance from the State Department. Thank you. Uh -huh, you're welcome, Kelly. Any other questions, Alexandra? That's um, that's it for now. Okay, let's move on to the LEA ARP ESSER use of funds plan. So the LEA ARP ESSER use of funds plan is the second plan required by LEA. Developing this plan, again, is a condition of receiving ARP ESSER funds, even though the LEA has access to the ARP ESSER funds before the plan is due. So um, uh, to the question earlier, um, LEAs have access to all of their ESSER funds. And you have that, you can, LEAs can draw down from the GRA, even though your plan is not submitted yet. Let's take a look at the different sections of the LEA ARP ESSER use of funds plan. The first part of the plan asks for identification information and a link to the LEA ARP ESSER use of funds plan on your website. The first section of the plan is really the meat of the plan. This section asks for a narrative description in six areas. We'll take a look at each of those areas. The first area is to describe the LEA's process, including a timeline for engaging meaningful consultation with stakeholders. Remember, this is a brand new plan. Identify the stakeholder groups involved. Describe how the public was given an opportunity to provide input in the development of the plan. So that means 
the LEA might publish the plan on their website and ask for input. The second criteria is to describe how the funds will be used to implement prevention and mitigation strategies that are consistent with the most recent CDC guidelines for reopening and, and operating schools for in-person learning. So in Idaho's case, um, not so much reopening, but keeping schools open. The third requirement is to describe how the LEAs will use that 20% of allotted ARP funds to address the academic impact of lost instructional time through the implementation of evidence-based interventions such as summer learning or summer enrichment, extended day, comprehensive after school program, extended school year, specifically address how the LEA will utilize funds to identify, re-engage and support students most likely to have experienced the impact of lost instructional time on learning. With an emphasis on students who missed the most in-person instruction during the 2019-2020 and 2020-2021 school year. A focus on students who did not consistently participate in remote instruction when offered during the school building closure and students most at risk of dropping out of school. A focus on subgroups of students disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 and that includes economically disadvantaged students, students of color, English learners, children with disabilities, students experiencing homelessness, children in foster care, migratory students, Hispanic students, and Native American students. The fourth requirement is to describe how the LEA will spend the remaining funds. So the 80% discretionary flow through consistent with the ARP Act and that's those 20 allowable activities. In your description, identify how funds will be allocated to schools and for district wide activities based on student need to equitably and inclusively support student success. I do know that the US Department of Ed is interested in knowing our LEAs distributing money to all of their schools or only Title I schools. And, I, and my, um, my guess is that most LEAs are supporting all of their schools. But, but in number four, um, describe how the LEA is supporting schools and what district-wide initiatives you are uh, using with the ESSER, ARP ESSER funds. The fifth requirement is, is describe how the LEA will ensure that the interventions it implements, including but not limited to the interventions implemented to address the ac academic impact of lost instructional time, will respond to the social, emotional, and mental health needs of all students but particularly those students disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Again, including students from low-income families, uh, English learners, children with disabilities, home students identified as homeless, children in foster care, migratory students, Native Americans, and Hispanic students. The last narrative requirement is to describe how the LEA will consistently monitor student progress and effectiveness of the strategies and interventions the LEA and schools are implementing to address gaps in student learning and well being. Section two of the LEA ARP ESSER use of funds plan includes five important assurances that include engaging meaningful consultation with stakeholders, including community groups who are represented in your community. And number four assures that the plan is written in an understandable and uniform format to the extent practic practicable, written in a language that parents can understand, and if not practicable, 
been orally translated. And upon request by a parent who is an individual with a disability will be provided in an alternative format accessible to the parent. Again, this plan needs to be publicly available on the LEA website. The last part of the ARP ESSER use of funds plan is the signature section, which includes both the superintendent or charter administrator signature and the local board of trustee president's signature. And this plan is due to Lisa English no later than October 1st. So before we move on, uh, are there any questions that, uh, that you have regarding the LEA ARP ESSER use of funds plan? Karen, we just want that one question to circle back around about the approval. Um, who actually approves the plan? Is it the local board? Yes, the local board should definitely approve the plan and then it's sent to the State Department of Ed and we review it and, um, and we'll reach out if there's anything missing. All right, that's it for questions. Um, that's question. it. Okay, all right, great. On June 30th, I attended a surprisingly interesting webinar on indoor air quality or IAQ and ventilation in America's K-12 schools. It uh, included guidance and strategies for improved air quality. Many LEAs, I bring this up because many LEAs are using ESSER funds to update or replace their HVAC systems, which is of course an allowable activity. What I wanted to share with you today is that the EPA has designed 11 checklists to engage school staff and key stakeholders in the process of school inspections and sustaining an IAQ or indoor air quality management program. Each checklist is accompanied by a backgrounder document that describes the purpose of the specific checklist. Checklists and backgrounders are available in 11 areas for teachers, administrative staff, school nurses, school officials, building maintenance staff, food service staff, waste management, ventilation, renovation and repairs, walkthrough inspections, and pest management. I highly encourage you to check out these resources and I have a sample of the school officials checklist on the slide. The capital expenditure pre-approval form is required to be completed and submitted to the State Department for any expenditures that meet two criteria, have a useful life of more than one year and a per unit cost, which equals or exceeds the lesser of the capitalization level established by the district for financial purposes or $5,000. Capital expenditures could include repairing and improving school facilities to support student health needs, conducting maintenance and upgrade projects to improve indoor quality, including heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, window and door replacements, and so forth. All capital expenditures must meet the necessary and reasonable requirements, and they are subject to inventory procedures. The job form capital expenditure pre-approval form is available at the link on your slide. We have a new form that was uh, just vetted and released. It is the procurement exemption form. The procurement exemption form has finally been vetted and is approved for LEAs who want to request an exemption for the procurement process using ESSER funds. SEAs have authority to authorize an LEA to use a non-competitive procurement in response to a written request under four circumstances. One, for curricular materials. Two, for emergency expenditures approved by the local school board. Three, sole source expenditures approved by the local school board. And four, after solicitation of a number of sources 
the competition is determined inadequate. An LEA may use non-competitive non -competitive procurement for these circumstances, as long as doing so is consistent with its own policies and procedures, and the LEA has written approval from the SBE. Submit this completed form to Lisa English, and it will be available on our website later this week. Um, if you need the form before then, just reach out to us and we will send it to you. Equity among the underserved populations is a major theme in ESSER, especially ARP ESSER. Nationwide generations of inequity have left too many students without equitable access to high quality, inclusive learning opportunities. Equity will exist when race, ethnicity, language, religion, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, national origin, physical or cognitive, cognitive ability, socioeconomic status, and other such characteristics are not predictors of outcomes for any group or individual. Equity is the attainment of comparable comparably positive outcomes for all groups within or served by a program. As long as we have subgroups of students who are not performing, we must look at the barriers to proficiency and address those students' needs. ESSER funds are one-time funds that should be used to identify and implement high quality inclusive learning opportunities for these groups of students who have barriers to improving academically and becoming proficient. At the end of this month, uh, at the end of July, states are required to submit an MO equity report to the US Department of Ed. Data for this report will include a list of high need LEAs, a list of Idaho's highest poverty schools, and per pupil amount of state funding provided to all LEAs. LEAs also have MO equity requirements for staffing and per pupil funding, and we are planning a separate MO equity webinar, which we will communicate to you very soon. Yesterday on July 6th, states were informed of an information collection request, opportunity to provide public comment regarding ESSER fund data collection to ensure two things, ensure public transparency on the impact of ESSER funds on students and schools, and ensure that data collection is as streamlined as possible, minimizing burden on states and LEA. And I really hope that that second one is true because the first uh, annual report that we had to file for ESSER one was so, was, so detailed that we left many of the data cells empty. So I, I know that the US Department of Ed is doing everything they can to communicate to, to states what their reporting requirements are going to be. It feels a little bit slow in it, but finally it sounds like by August 31st, um, once US Ed has collected all their feedback from states that we will be provided some information that we can then communicate to you on what the reporting requirements will be for the three ESSER funds. We will definitely keep you posted in this area because this is a very important area. Last month, federal programs began a mini webinar series on the use of ESSER funds. So on June 10th, uh, Jill, Matthews co-facilitated a uh, webinar on using ESSER funds to build a community school. And on June 21st, uh, Kathy Dobby facilitated a webinar on evidence-based interventions and the tiers of um, intervention levels. Coming up, we will have several different mini webinars on using ESSER funds for specific underserved populations. We'll begin these in late August. We're taking a break in July because we know that many of you are not available in July. Um, so we will start those in late August. So you can look forward to those. 
just a reminder because we continue to get questions on fund numbers. So for all the ESSER grants, the revenue code is 44590. We are highly recommending the following fund numbers and I farm uh, for um, CARES Act ESSER 1, 252, SIRSA Act ESSER 2, 254, and ARP Act ESSER 3, 250. Each ESSER grant must be tracked separately because we have to report on each of these grants separately. Just a word about using subcodes. So uh, 250 ARP Act, Act ESSER is a really good example. You will be receiving um, flow through discretionary funds and then um, lost instructional time funds. So one of those might be 250, your flow through funds might be 250.01, uh, and then the um, lost instructional time funds might be 250.02. That's just an idea. Again, for um, CARES Act ESSER 1, we had flow through funds, we had LMS funds, and we had SEL funds. So maybe 252.01 would be discretionary, 252.02 for LMS, 252.03 for um, uh, SEL. Processing GRA reimbursement requests has moved from weekly back to bi-monthly. So this means that transactions posted the close of business on the 10th and 24th will be processed on the 11th and the 25th. Data reports will be updated following the processing dates. You may recall that six months ago, accounting and federal programs moved to processing weekly GRA drawdowns from twice monthly to weekly because the 2021 legislature expressed concern that some LEAs were experiencing cash flow issues with their federal funds. Moving to weekly drawdowns increased the workload for accounting staff, federal program staff, and IT staff. After evaluating the change after the six month period, it was determined that the, the statistical difference between twice monthly and weekly GRA draws was not enough to justify the additional time and expense. Please let us know if you have any questions about this. We have updated our website. So from the um, main menu, sbe.idaho.gov, go to federal programs and then federal pro from federal programs, you can click on the pandemic relief funds link. And from there you can act, there will be some general information on that page. And if you want specific information for any of the three ESSER grants, you can um, click on the link or the button there. We all play a role in identifying, preventing and stopping education related coronavirus response fraud. Contact the Office of Inspector General Special Investigations Unit for more information or to report fraud. Here's our contact information. Um, please, I'll open it up for questions, but please let us know anytime uh, if something comes up that you need, where you need more information or you have some questions. Are there any questions, Alexandra? So uh, speaking of the website, there was only one comment about the mini webinars, um, whether they were posted on the website the one that Jill conducted and the one that Kathy conducted a few weeks ago. And um, just by looking at it right now, I do not see them posted there. So I, I assume we can just email them out um, if, if the folks would contact us um, for that information. Sure, yes, you're, you're correct, Alexandra. And that's a great solution to email out uh, to anybody who is interested in receiving those now. They're in the, those two webinars are in the process of being made accessible. And as soon as they're accessible, we will put them on our website. Any other questions? No, not at this point. 
I'm going to stop sharing. And thank you uh, so much for joining today. We uh, really appreciate everything that you're doing. Um, this has been an incredible last 15 or 16 months, and there's still work to do. Uh, we're here to support you, so please contact us anytime. Thank you so much. And I do hope all of you get some time to rest and uh, reconnect with your balanced self sometime this summer. All right, thank you everyone.